On this super live unboxing, we're gonna take a look at the Tin Hi-Fi T2 Plus. And I've probably told this story too many times by now, but the first IAM I ever reviewed was the original Tin Hi-Fi T2, and I loved it at the time, and frankly, I still like that IAM quite a bit. Tin Hi-Fi later came out with the T2 Pro, which looked exactly like the T2 original. In fact, its sound signature was pretty similar, it just had like a little bit more treble. But now they're coming back with the T2 Plus, and I'm kind of curious why they chose to stick with the name T2, and what do they mean by Plus? So what I do know about this IEM is that like the original T2 and the T2 Pro, this is a single dynamic driver earphone. I think it's like a 10 millimeter dynamic driver and they don't make any claims about beryllium coatings or titanium, platinum, anything like that. It's just a basic 10 millimeter driver, which is fine, especially when you consider the price, which for the T2 Plus is 60 bucks. So 60 bucks is a little bit more than the original T2, but about actually the same price as the T2 Pro. And I hope I said that right, because that's a lot of different T2s I'm talking about, and I'm probably mixing it up, and hopefully it makes sense for you. But just to reiterate, the T2 Plus. So still single dynamic driver, still 60 bucks. And from what they claim on their website, they're still aiming for, they call it a studio uh, sound signature. So I'm expecting a sound signature that sounds somewhat like the originals, but maybe, maybe a little bit different, right? If I were to critique the original T2 in terms of it being sort of a studio reference sound, I would say that the original T2, uh, it's a little bit on the mid bassy side. And I think that the upper mid range kind of, it doesn't have as much forwardness as I would expect from a truly reference IEM. I think also the treble may be a little bit on the sharp side, but getting picky for a $40 IEM, kind of curious to see how they've done with the T2 Plus, an extra 20 bucks, maybe they made it better. Um, yeah, that's about as much as I can say about this. So let's go ahead and head to the table, I'll unbox it. And while I'm doing this, this is a live stream. I am talking to you live right now. I see you in the live chat. If you've got questions about the T2 Plus or really anything else that I've talked about on the channel recently, go ahead and queue up those questions in live chat. And if you're watching this and it's not live for you, you're watching the VOD, that's fine, we don't judge. But if you wanna be part of the live stream in the future, subscribe to the channel, ding the bell. I, I feel weird saying that because I'm an old man talking about dinging a bell, but ding the bell and YouTube will let you know the next time I go live and then we can have a conversation. But for now, let's go ahead and take a look at the T2 Plus. That was maybe my best live stream spin yet. So T2 Plus, very, this box looks very familiar to the, the box that the T2 came in, the T2 Pro, even the T3 kind of came in a very similar looking box, very understated. White, not a lot of information here on the back. Uh, we know where it's made and we've got a QR code for you QR code enthusiasts. Have at it. But other than that, there is not much information here. So I guess we're just gonna have to crack this thing open. Sorry, plant. And it looks like very much like the T2 and T2 Pro, the Plus comes in a little blue box, which is cute. Although this doesn't feel quite as fancy as the box that the T2 Pro or the T2 and the T2 Pro came in, I frankly I'm okay with that because fancy boxes for 60 bucks, I don't necessarily need it. Simple lift there, and you see the IMs sitting in the box. And interestingly, this is actually a very different design physically from the T2 and the T2 Pro. We'll take a look at those in a little bit more detail later, but. We've got a cable, we've got some tips, and we gotta take a look at this sweet, sweet paperwork, of course. Nothing interesting there. Here we've got some sort of warranty quality card, maybe. Let everyone, let everyone enjoy high quality music. Let everyone be able to enjoy high quality music. I think that is, a fine motto for your company. Let's take a look at these tips real quick. Um, so interestingly, this thing comes with, well, it looks like a gaggle of silicone tips as well as a couple of foam tips. The original T2s, they came with a pretty signature style, signature looking uh, blue foam tips. And I thought those blue foam, those blue foam tips looked pretty cool, but 
that it have sort of a tendency to disintegrate a little bit. Here we don't have quite that signature look, but the, the quality on these tips actually seems pretty nice. The foam tip seems pretty typical for foam tips, but the, the silicone tips, I think, honestly, have got like a bit of a better gumminess and shape to them than your average budget I am, which is nice. Let's do the ritual situating of the ear tips. nice actually that they have included so many different sizes and now I'm probably not getting this order exactly right but five different silicone tips to choose from you should be able to get a pretty good fit with one of those uh, especially given that they appear to be fairly nice quality tips as well all right now let's take a look at this cable that they come with and this is gonna be an interesting point too is like the original t2 cable it was a fine cable, um, but it did have some issues with it, especially, you know, known for MMCX connector issues. And then the TIN came out with a T3, which came with probably the best cable that TIN's ever put on an IM. And there's the T4, which I'm not the biggest fan of the cable on the, T, the TIN T4. It looks a little cool, but it's kind of, kind of gummy and grippy. And this appears to be somewhere in between, I would say, the T3 and the T4 cable. This doesn't have any of those issues as far as being like almost sticky in a sense. Maybe not quite as flashy looking as the T3 cable, but I gotta say this is, my initial impression is this is a very nice cable. Especially for a $60 IAM. Right, let's see how it winds up well, or if it winds up well. Got some kinks sort of baked into it uh, that should loosen up with time but there you go there's the cable let's go ahead and take a look at these actual buds so yeah this is a very very different shape from the original t 10t2s and also notable that there's actually a sixth pair of ear tips pre-installed on here just for comparison i'll go ahead and pull in the original 10t2 and this cable is not the original stock cable, just kind of an upgraded cable that I put on it. And it actually, frankly, it's pretty similar to the cable that actually, the stock cable that comes with the 10T2 Plus. Uh, but yeah, look at those. These pieces are pretty nice looking, frankly. It's a very much different aesthetic that they've gone for. With the original 10T2, I think it's like kind of a cool industrial look to it, but you know, it's got sharp edges on it that I didn't necessarily feel in my ear but I can imagine might be an issue for some people. It's also maybe, I don't know, this just looks more finished, I think. When you get down to the opposite side, let's go ahead and take the tips off so we can compare. And I think that just based on initial impressions, I think this 10T2 Pro Plus, did I get that right? The Plus, I think this is gonna fit easier for a lot of people. You can see that the nozzle here on the original 10T2 is a little bit short past this chamber. Whereas here with the 10T2 Plus, the, the nozzle and the chamber kind of have a more natural taper. And so I imagine that's gonna fit a little bit better. Uh, overall, yeah, it's kind of a, a rounded, a more rounded, elegant shape. Let's go ahead and throw this thing onto a cable. It's actually kind of hard to handle without a cable because it's so smooth. You see me dropping it a lot, that's why. Also because I'm clumsy. So there you go. There is your tin T2 plus. What do you guys think right away? Go ahead and give it an initial fit test so you can try it out. Uh, the cable, as you might've seen, does come with a chin cinch which I tend to enjoy when it stays in place. And we'll see about this one. It seems like that one's gonna stay in place fairly well. And then the fit, that is not too bad. So, you know, the nozzle honestly is not that long in, 
So the, the fit is not especially deep versus something like the Moondrop SSR that I recently reviewed. I think the SSR has got a little bit of a deeper fit, um, but in terms of comfort, this is actually pretty solid just right off the bat. Nestles pretty neatly into the inside of my ear. Again, the fit inside my ear canal is not very deep, but it does appear to have produced a satisfactory seal. Uh, I'm not hearing any microphonics or anything coming through the cable as I do that, which is nice. Security seems pretty secure. And yeah, I don't know. I guess first impressions, that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. Um, but obviously I got to listen to this thing and actually evaluate it. So what I'm going to do is for probably the next week or so is I'm going to spend some time living with the T2 plus comparing it to the original T2 as well as the Moondrop SSR because that's recently come out as well as the Blonde BL03 and 05 because I think those are things that people are probably going to be cross shopping in this $60 price category. And so if you're watching this video and you were just looking for the unboxing, that's the end of the video. If you want to check these things out, of course, I've got links in the description down below. Hit the like button if you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next time, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want more, we're still doing this thing live. So let's go ahead and have a conversation, do a little Q&A and answer your questions. That's kind of what Q&A means. So I probably didn't need to say that again, but from now on, I'm going to be looking down here and I'm sorry, it's, I'm, I'm, it's rude. I'm, I'm missing eye contact, but I got to read these questions. So thanks for watching, et cetera, et cetera. Let's keep this thing going. Mattia Lembo saying, sup man, sup Mattia. Dem Demigo saying, hole up, another T2. Yeah, another T2. It's kind of interesting that Tin Hi-Fi, like their whole, their whole naming structure and uh, scheme with the T series is interesting, right? So there was the T2, the T2 Pro, which was basically the same thing as the T2, at least in terms of construction, very similar in tuning. Um, and then they went with the T3, which was pretty different. I and mean, it had a very similar look to the T2, uh, but it did have, uh, they, there they went with like a dynamic driver and a, a balanced armature driver, sort of a hybrid situation. Tuning wise, again, it was very actually similar to the T2 Plus. And then they came out with the T4, which dropped the ba balanced armature driver, just became a single dynamic driver earphone. And the T4 actually went for a different sound signature, still a little bit on the bright sort of neutral side. And of all those three, I would say that the T4 is probably my, my favorite sounding. It's just got a really nice, satisfying sub bass and enough brightness in it to make it part of what I like about the T series, right? I like bright sounding IEMs and Tin Hi-Fi with the T series is kind of stuck with that. I'm curious to see if that's what they've stuck with here with the T2 Plus. Although obviously just looking at it, this one's more different than the other ones, huh? Interestingly, the T2 Plus appears to be more different from the T2 than the T4 did, at least aesthetically. Gooey saying, I just picked up the Starfields. How do these compare? So I haven't listened to these things at all yet. Um, so I can't really answer that question. What I would say is that the Starfield is a very, very nice sounding IM, very smooth. Um, I would guess that the Starfield is gonna have stronger bass than what you'll get here. And I would guess that this is gonna be a little bit brighter of a sound than the Starfield. But again, I haven't actually listened to it, so I probably shouldn't be talking out of turn. Uh, Rynette are saying, I miss the offline reviews, sad face. So yeah, I ha I've been doing basically just live streams for the past couple of months, mostly because I don't really like editing videos in Adobe Premiere. And if you miss something about the old videos, I apologize. I can just honestly, let me know, give me your feedback. What are the things that you miss? And maybe there I can find ways to incorporate it into the live streams. That said, there's, eh, it's going to be hard for me to go back to the sort of the more, and they're not even scripted, but just the more performative uh, uh, and edited videos because I don't know, I just, I really don't like editing video, frankly. Ryan Wazingo saying sick shirt. Oh, thank you for noticing. This is the high res placebo shirt. Actually, we've got a super logo on the back. And if you're interested in getting this shirt, I actually have made it available for sale on Teespring. I think I've got a link pinned to the top of chat, but 
Also, if you're not in chat or you're looking for it somewhere else, I pinned a comment underneath this video that has links to things like the Super Review Discord channel, which you can freely join. It also has a link to my Instagram account, which you can follow, and then as well, a link to the shirt if you're interested in dressing like me, which is a weird thing to say, but maybe you want to dress like me, actually. Anyway, thank you for noticing. Peace.exe saying perfect spin. Holy, I agree. That was, I was surprised at how good that spin was. I practiced it a couple of times, I'll be honest. I practiced it a couple of times before the, the live stream started and none of them were any good. So that one surprised me quite a bit. Hendro Harianta saying 10T2 plus. Next will be the 10T2 plus plus. I'm actually hoping that the next 10 Hi-Fi I am is the super 10 Hi-Fi T2 Plus Turbo Hyper Fighting Edition. That's an old man joke. Intuit Review saying, been looking forward to this, getting mine on Tuesday. That's awesome. Very interested to chat it up with you and learn what you, what you think about the 10 T2 Plus. Again, if you guys want to uh, join the Super Review Discord, Intuit's in there all the time. In fact, Intuit has his own Discord. If you want to chat with him, you can follow, you ping, him in, in Discord, ping him in my Discord channel. I'm sure he'll give you a link to his as well. Uh, you got saying, my 10 T3s just broke. Any suggestions? So I'm kind of curious, how did they break? What, what's broken about them? That might inform my suggestion if my suggestion is like how to repair it or is my suggestion supposed to be how to replace it and then kind of depends on what did you think of the 10 t3 did you like it were the things that it didn't do that you wanted things that it did do that you didn't like you gotta tell me i don't know 10 t3 like if i were a 10 t3 owner and i was a satisfied 10 t3 owner and i was looking for an upgrade and the 10 t4 is not a bad option sound signature is a little bit different um, frankly, I don't really know anything that sounds exactly like the 10T2 or the 10T3, except for my 10T2 Pro. Wow, this is, this is getting ridiculous. I'm going to stop talking about 10 Hi-Fi. That's not serious. This is a video about 10 Hi-Fi. I'm not going to stop talking about it. Uh, Waris Amir saying, they claim this will be the final 10T revision. That's interesting. We'll see about that. I'm curious, like, yeah, I would really love to talk to somebody uh, in charge of not just the naming schemes, but like, I imagine Tin Hi-Fi is a relatively small company. It'd be, it would be really interesting to talk to them about their rationale. They're thinking about different things. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of information coming out of the chai fi market, right? You can find interviews with Sennheiser. You can find interviews with uh, AKG, I'm sure, but I haven't really seen much talk with the people behind Chi-Fi. I know Moondrop is fairly open about their development processes and thinking and stuff like that, but Tin Hi-Fi, apart from their Twitter feed, and I do follow them on Twitter, I haven't really seen much from them. Andre Florea saying, honestly, just looking toward a pair of IEMs that are as flat as possible. Your sound engineer, not that the Tin T2s, but these may seem worthwhile, or not, that are not 10 T2s, okay. But these seem that they may be worthwhile. Any suggestion for a flat pair under $100? So I guess it really depends on what you mean by flat. Like flat is, uh, there's a bunch of different, you know, tuning targets, whether it's um, flat versus a Harman neutral flat, or is it flat versus uh, diffuse field flat, or is it flat on Krinical's measurement? Like I've never seen anything measure actually literally flat, although probably the closest thing to flat that I've seen in terms of measurement, in terms of like raw graphs that get produced would be something like the Tin Hi-Fi P1, um, not under a hundred bucks like you're asking for. So this is a bad way of answering your question. Um, I would say that under a hundred dollars, the thing that appears to be the closest to sort of a flat neutral sound might be the Moondrop SSR that I recently reviewed. Um, obviously that has got quite a bit of pin gain. It's got quite a bit of upper mid range lift to it. And in fact, probably a little bit too much for most people's taste. 
Um, if you were looking for something that could just take a mild amount of EQ and really get it to something that's quite close to an actually neutral sound, I think the SSR is that. I think you can get the SSR really, really close to actually neutral for 40 bucks for that. And that's, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty competitive. Otherwise, uh, of all the things that I've got, like, I don't know, the Edemotic ER2 SE you can get for around a hundred bucks. In fact, I think I got mine on Amazon, like open box for about 90 bucks. So technically I did that. And that is uh, even more closer. I would say that the ER2 SE is definitely fully neutral. Whether or not that counts as flat, eh, again, that depends on your definition. Wara Samir saying that the quality of tips that comes with Chi-Fi stuff is all over the place. I totally agree. It's, it's, it's kind of weird, um, kind of surprising, but honestly, it's not even just with Chi-Fi. Like even with some more expensive gear, the quality of stuff that you can get is a little bit all over the place. So for example, I have the Shure SE215 which by Chi-Fi standards is not cheap. It's a hundred dollar IEM, but maybe by Sure standards is, is cheap. For a hundred bucks, the tips are fine, but the quality of the cable I found quite lacking. Did not like the cable that came on the SE. And then there's also like the Sennheiser IE40 Pro, which I have, which similarly, I think the, the, the rubber on the tips there is actually not that great. And then the cable, the cable's not bad, it's just not MMCX, which is kind of annoying. So it's, a, it's its own proprietary connector specifically. That is the annoying aspect of it. Um, but then, yeah, I would say like, you know, the Moondrop SSR, everything that came with that, I found to be top quality. Here with the Tin hi fi T2 Plus, everything, the tips and the cable that have come with it appear to be pretty high quality. I haven't tested it to make sure it all works, but at least the initial impression, it is high quality. Uh, Hiran Patel saying, I bought the 10T2 and the quality control was bad. My connector pin broke and I had to throw them out. Yeah, so there were, the 10T2 was kind of known for having issues with its MMCX connectors. And now I don't know if those issues were necessarily the connectors on the, the IEMs, the buds, or if it was the connectors on the cable. I mean, I know that my 10T2 Pro, it came with a bad MMCX connector on the cable. I was able to use a different cable and it solved my problems, but uh, yeah, I, I, that was an IEM that was known for having some MMCX issues. Ryan Christopher saying, I am digging the look. And just again, to remind us, I too am digging this look. That is a good looking IEM for 60 bucks. It's nice and smooth. I like the matte finish to it. Um, it's not going to gather any fingerprints. It doesn't appear to be painted. So there's no unevenness. Like you get a little bit of unevenness with the SSR as much as, as I enjoy the build on that. And then you look on the inside of this, that's all smooth. So I cannot imagine any part of this being uncomfortable in an ear. Now there's a good chance. I don't say a good chance, but there's a chance this doesn't fit your ear exactly, but I don't think it's going to be uncomfortable. And there's actually some print on there. I didn't notice just the tin hi-fi logo and a serial number in case you can't see that on screen. I hear and saying I also have the tin P1, so it's not like I don't like what they're doing. Uh, the biggest thing I worry about is the quality control and it breaking within one to two months. So I mean, here's what I can say from my experience, right? I have the Tin T2, the Tin T2 Pro, the Tin T3, the Tin T4, the Tin Hi-Fi P1, and now I've got this. Ignore this one for now because I just got it. But of all those other ones, none of them have been a problem for me. I mean, I mentioned the cable on the Tin T2 Pro was bad out of the box, but apart from that, like nothing's gone bad over time. They've held up to me, to my usage. Uh, here and also saying, I like the blonde BL03 for the funness. And yeah, look, if you, if you want like a fun bassy I am, I don't know that this is going to be it again. I haven't heard it yet. So I don't know for sure. I don't know anything about the sound of this, frankly. Um, but tin T2s generally are not fun bassy IMs. They're a little bit more analytical sounding, I suppose. 
um, a little bit more tuned on the neutral end, neutral bright end. And for some people that's fun. For people like me, I kind of prefer that personally to bass. But if you like a lot of bass, Tinty twos tend to not be the thing. All right, I'm falling behind on the live stream or live chat. I apologize for that. Um, Ardiac added the blonde BL05 is supposedly a more tame signature. And I can say I am, what do I got? I have the blonde BL05 sitting over there. I am reviewing that right now spending some time with that. And I'll probably do a quick review of that maybe in the middle of this week, this upcoming week. Um, I can say that the Blonde BL05 is not a bad sounding earphone, but I think that it misses some of the character and the reason why you might've been interested in the BL03. It is, it's a compromise. It's, it's not as bassy and um, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I don't think that is about bad sounding IEM at all, but I do think that it is, um, it doesn't have as strong a case for it as the BL-03. And to do. What have you guys been listening to lately? Not just IEMs, music wise, what have you been listening to? El Jefe saying, glad to see you back in a steady rhythm. What's up, El Jefe? Yeah, um, things have settled down. I've gotten used to living at home and working at home and doing almost everything at home. Not that I go out very much anyway, uh, but quarantine life is settling in nicely and I'm happy to spend some time reviewing IEMs and other stuff. DNTR saying, Tin T2, this isn't even my final form. Who said, what is that quote from? This isn't even my final form. That's gotta be like some Dragon Ball shit, right? A lot of discussion about both Tinty 2 and the Blonde BL03, which I think is just a good, it's just a confirmation, honestly, that those two products, I think, have kind of owned the sub $50 market or sort of the budget market for a long time. The Tin T2 original came out, I think, two years ago at this point. It's been about two years. And then the Blonde came out a little, a little less than a year ago. And I think if you're looking for something neutral bright, the Tin T2 is kind of the recommendation for under 50 bucks. And if you're looking for something that's a little more bassy, a little bit more traditional, um, well, a little bit more mainstream sound, the Blonde BL03, I think, is kind of the winner there. It was KZ for a while, but KZ's kind of, I don't know, I haven't found a KZ that doesn't have some caveats with it. And the Blonde BL03, I don't think it has any really strong caveats with it. If you like that tuning, it's done very well. Uh, Demigo asking, how do I feel about burning in headphones? Um, I can only talk about from my experience, right? So I only know my experience. I have not uh, done extensive testing with, uh, you know, in, in sort of like a production capacity. Um, and I, you know, I gotta say like burn-in is not a thing I'm looking for. So my personal experience is burn-in is not a thing I've noticed. What I have noticed is that Sometimes my first impression of an IEM doesn't hold up to extended listening. And maybe that's burn-in, maybe that's brain burn-in, maybe it's just, it, you know, dependent on my, my mood, what I was listening to, how I fit it. Like there's a bunch of different things that can affect the, the way that an IEM sounds. And I, burn-in makes sense to me. Like if you describe burn-in and like as, as a mechanism, um, that things, especially a dynamic driver, things that are moving, um, the more that you use them, the more that they kind of wear in, like a pair of jeans, right? You put on a pair of jeans day one, it fits different than a pair of jeans three months from now. So that makes sense to me that it could impact the sound of an IEM. I'm just saying that from my own personal experience, I have never observed that an IEM sounded significantly different one day versus another day that I would attribute to Burnin.
Kieran is asking, are you worried about quality control issues with the MMCX connector and how will you test for its reliability? Honestly, no, I'm not that concerned about it. I mean, I think it's always a risk, honestly, with any, any product. And I haven't really noticed any patterns between MMCX or two pin. Most cables that I've have are, have all been, they've all held up to, to my use and I'm not particularly hard on them. In fact, all my IEMs I store in these little boxes. I don't have one handy, but I store in these little plastic boxes. So I take pretty good care of all my stuff, frankly. Um, I might not be the first person to find out that an MMCX connector or a cable has a particular problem. Uh, the only problems I've ever had with cables, let's see. I mentioned the T2 Pro came with a, a bum cable out of the box. That was MMCX. My, uh, my Moondrop Blessing 2 actually came with a bum cable out of the box. That was a two pin. Apart from that, I mean, I've got like some cheap TRN cables. I bought an AliExpress that kind of fell apart as I was using them, but those are problems that like manifested pretty quickly. So my experience is that usually if there's a problem with a cable, I'll find out right away. And if it's a problem that develops over time with like extended wear, I'm probably not gonna find that out for a couple of reasons. One, because like I mentioned, I take pretty good care of all my equipment. I don't throw it into a bag. I don't throw my IMs in my pocket and stuff like that often. Um, so that kind of wear and tear, I am not putting on my gear. And then the other thing is just that because I'm reviewing new stuff all the time, I'm probably not gonna live with this thing for the next year, the way that a, a potential buyer might. And so that's something you should definitely consider when you are listening to any, any reviewer, honestly, unless it's a reviewer that doesn't review a lot of things, unless it's a reviewer who, you know, is, is just sort of a, a, has a YouTube channel and they're not constantly going through new gear. They're just publishing re reviews about the equipment that they're buying for themselves. They're probably going to have, frankly, a better, a better opinion about the durability of an IM in day-to-day -day life. My, 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 you know, again, my experience is, is going to be a little bit colored on the basis of how I do things. And take a mod saying, hey, looks you're well, how does the SSR have an enjoyable amount of bass or don't have any? So the SSR, the Moondrop SSR, that was the last IEM that I reviewed. In fact, I think that was my last, the most recent video that I published before this one. Check that out if you haven't already. So the SSR is a $40 IEM. It's a little bit cheaper here than the T2 plus. Um, and I quite liked the SSR. If you look at it on a frequency graph, and I think this is what uh, Antic is, is, is asking about. If you look at it on a frequency graph, uh, it is a, you could describe it as a baselet IM. There's not a lot of bass in volume tuned into the SSR. That said, I actually find that the bass on the SSR is very, very satisfying for my personal taste. I'm not that big into bass. If you've watched all my reviews, that's pretty consistent with the things that I tend to like. In fact, like the Moondrop uh, Spaceship, not Spaceship, the Moondrop Starfield, get my Moondrops mixed up now. The Starfield is one of the most popular Moondrop IMs, and for, I think, good reason, but for me, it's a little bit, what that, that IM does really well is the bass. And that's great for people who really love a bassy IM. And for me, I'm just not that into bassy IM. So for me, that actually wasn't as appealing to me as something like the SSR, which goes for a little bit more of a leaner, brighter sound where the bass doesn't have a ton of volume, but I think that it does still have a nice kick, like a nice punch to it. And it gives it plenty of texture in the bass. And usually that's what I want. I want tone and texture in my bass. I don't necessarily want volume. If you want volume in your bass, you're probably not gonna like the SSR. If you're like me and you like a little bit more of a neutral bass, there's a good chance you'll be satisfied with the bass on the SSR. In fact, I like the bass on the SSR better than the bass on the Edemotix sort of uh, studio reference, studio tuned IEMs. Ryan Christopher saying, for me, the KXXS needs at least 20 hours of burn-in only experience as far as I've gone through IM. So I'm curious, yeah, Ryan, from your experience, what, what changed about the KXXS after about 20 hours of burn-in? I know Moondrop tends to recommend burn-in with their IMs. I'm trying to remember where I read that. If it was on their Instagram account or somewhere else, they were talking about recommending a, a minimum like 20 to 30 hours of burn-in. Um, 
But even in that description, they were saying like, it makes a minimal amount of difference and it's really just sort of like, to check, it's 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 dotting, crossing your T's and dotting your I's as far as the sound signature. What they're describing, what Moondrop's describing, and what I think other people are probably describing from Burnin, is you're not gonna drastically change the sound of an IEM. Domingo saying, I should do a live listen and then a first impression. I don't, I don't know if you guys want to sit here and watch me listen to this thing for five or 10 minutes. And frankly, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm slightly shy about giving initial impressions about audio because uh, initial impressions can be misleading, right? There've been some IMs in the past that I listened to initially and I thought, meh. But the more I listened to them, I actually quite liked them and kind of on the opposite either, right? There's IMs that I liked quite a bit to begin with. Um, that over time I was like, it's not actually doing too much for me. So I don't know, maybe I'll give this a little bit of a listen when I catch up with chat and give you a first impression. But with that caveat that I, I, I do reserve the right to change my opinion before my review. And I do plan on doing a full review of this in case I didn't actually make that clear. I do plan on doing a full review after spending some time with the T2 Plus. Burnt saying, got the Rose Mini 4 last week after two months. <laughs> yeah, shipping things, out of, shipping things out of China right now is pretty slow, understandably. But I absolutely love them, better than my 10 T4. So yeah, the Rose Mini 2 is an IEM that I, re I reviewed, and Rose has a bunch of other mini IEMs. They're just, they're super, super small, all balanced armature IEMs that they all look really interesting. And I'm, I'm interested to try the Rose Mini 4. How would you describe the sound? And especially since you have the context of the 10 T4, how would you describe the Rose Mini 4 versus the 10 T4? Oh, we just got a super chat in. So let me answer your question here in. Herein, you've been asking a bunch of questions and I appreciate all of them. You don't have to super chat me, but I appreciate it. Uh, I will answer your question here. Thanks for your, your reviews and videos. Keep it up as long as it is meaningful to you. I have to leave for some errands now. Herein, thanks for watching. Enjoy your day. Hope to talk to you more in the future. Just knock my Walkman down. That was worth five bucks though, right? All right, go back to earlier. Uh, Matthew Rahala is asking, from all of the T-Series, which one would you recommend buying, uh, considering value and quality? Would be my first pro earphone. I think, hmm, I think the Tin T4 is the easiest recommendation, especially if you can find it for 80 bucks. I know sometimes its price bounces between $80 and like $110. I think at 80 bucks, the Tin T4 is really, really hard to beat. In fact, I don't know, I don't think there's anything that I would pick over the Tin T4 at that price range. Um, I, and the reason I think the T4 is the easiest to recommend is because of all the T lines that I've heard so far, and again, I haven't heard the 10 T2 Plus yet, of all the ones that I have heard so far, the T4 has the best bass. And it's not a lot of bass, but it's the best bass. It's nice and sub bass focused. It gives a nice body to it. And I think for people who are getting, especially if it's your first IM, and you, you might not have a great sense for what you're looking for in a sound signature, I think the Tin T4 is actually a really good option. The Tin T2, I think also still a really good option. It's half the price, so that's an easy recommendation as well. But if you're looking, you're looking for something that is almost guaranteed to be satisfying, I think the Tin T4 is a good place to start. Uh, MK Shira saying, when you do a review of the 10 T2 Plus, please compare it to the Blonde BLO3 and the Moondrop Starfield. I probably will compare it to all of this. In fact, you know, the Starfield, I wasn't thinking about comparing it to initially, but I don't know. We'll see how bassy it is. If, if this has, 
If this has a base character that's a little bit closer to the T10, well, the 10 T4 than the other T2s, I might compare it to the Starfield because I think that would be a worthwhile. Um, but if the base character is a little bit more like the 10 the, of the other T2s, I don't know that that would be a very useful comparison. Just because they're different on price range and then also pretty different on sound signature, if that's the case. I'm just speculating here. Jose Luis asking the question about what music. You're saying new Fiona Apple is great and some pop jazz too. New, I have heard that there's a new Fiona Apple album, and which is interesting. I don't know how many of you, I know a lot of people in the audiophile community, at least on YouTube and on Discord, seem to be pretty young. I don't know if a lot of you guys remember Fiona Apple. I remember when Fiona Apple first came out, like in the, the mid 90s. I'm old, but I'm okay with that. Uh, Jairab Desai asking, hey, I'm not sure if you ever shared what your real name is. Yeah, I don't really talk about it. I don't like introduce myself, but it's not a secret or anything. My name is Mark Ryan. Hey, what's up? Uh, if you join my Discord channel, I go by my initials, MRS, but um, yeah, people call me Mark, people call me Ryan, people call me Mark Ryan, people call me MRS, people call me, hey, you, dude. All of these are appropriate. I'm fine with anything that you want to call me. Uh, Waris was answering the music question, just waiting for new Proto Martyr to drop. Interesting. Proto Martyr is not an artist I'm familiar with. What sort of what genre is that? Lately, for me, what I've been listening to is a little bit of Burhana. Um, he has the the album Han H A N, which I think is really a really satisfying listen. It's got nice uh, nice bass notes, nice and clean sound, and his vocals I really like quite a bit. Um, also been listening to the artist Men I Trust, sort of like a, at least most of their albums, or at least two of the three albums I have, sort of electronic music with primarily female vocals. Um, very, very satisfying, very smooth, very chill. I like to be chill. William and Doak. William Mendonca, will you ever consider custom in-ear monitor? So the, the question of custom is kind of like an obvious next step, right? For someone who has a bunch of different IEMs, I've got, you know, things that I really love the sound of. A custom IEM seems like kind of the obvious step up, but I haven't done that yet. And partly it's because frankly, like the fit of universal IEMs, I'm pretty, pretty happy with. I imagine there's something I'm missing out on. I just, I haven't experienced the fit of a custom and maybe, maybe once I try a custom, I'll hate the way that all of these universals fit. But for the most part, I get pretty satisfactory fit from universals. Um, and then the other thing for me about customs, honestly, what kind of puts me off of them, one, they're a little bit pricey, right? There's some expense with getting it custom made for you. But then there's also just the risk that it doesn't, it doesn't sound the same in custom form as it does when you demo sort of a, the universal version of it. And uh, I don't know, like I, this is actually kind of a habit that even follows through to, you know, the way I use and customize smartphones and my computer is I generally don't like, this is gonna sound weird, and probably not gonna describe this very adequately, but I don't really like customizing things so much to the point that I can't like, easily replicate it, if that makes sense, right? Customizations that I can't easily replicate, like let's say I broke, I found a custom monitor, it sounds exactly perfect, and then I drop it in water or something and ruin it. If it's hard for me to replicate that thing exactly, that's like a, that's just like a weird mental block that I have and I don't, I don't like that. So like, I don't want to get used to something that's not easy to replicate. Whereas something universal, like the 10T2 Plus, you know, if it fits, if I find something that fits me great and I can buy it on Amazon and I accidentally break it, lose it, get stolen, something like that, if I can easily replace it, I tend to prefer that. That's just like sort of a weird uh, optimization strategy that I have that carries through into other things in my life. But that is probably the greatest reason why I don't have a custom monitor at this point. 
All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna scroll ahead to um, catch up with chat because I am doing a very, very bad job. Asian Hat asking, I wonder, was wondering how the Kodungari Brass compares to all these new IEMs. That's an interesting question. Um, I haven't listened to the Kodungari Brass in a while, so I can't answer that offhand. Um, my initial, and based on like memory, I remember the treble on the Kodungori being fairly forward. Um, but that's not, I don't think that's answering your question. My recommendation, honestly, if you want to chat about this more is join the discord chat. And this is something that I would be more than happy to like do like I'll pull out both. I'll listen to them and I'll kind of give you my impressions in real time offhand. I don't really have much to say about that. Some more support for Fiona Apple album. I'll have to check that out. I do. I have really quite liked, um, I have really quite liked, female vocals for the past like 10 years, honestly. A lot of the music I listen to is primarily female vocals. Um, maybe that's why I like the Moondrop SSR so much. Taryn saying, am I blind? I can't find the Discord link. So Taryn, I believe that I pinned it, I left it as a comment to this video. So there should be a comment below the video that's pinned. And whether or not that shows up in whatever application you're on, I'm sorry. Um, there you go. Hopefully you can find it. Otherwise, um, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Oh, Warsamir was following up on the, the band name, which was something like Post Martyr or something like that. He said it's post-punk music. Interesting. What's like the, the production quality on a genre like that? I, I, I know that might be kind of an annoying question to ask. Um, for some people, like, production quality is not the number one or is even like a, an important significant factor in evaluating what sort of music to listen to. And I think there's a good argument that, that it shouldn't necessarily be right. If you're in mu into music for the music it should be about the songwriting the melodies, the, you know, the, the thematics and stuff like that. But if I'm perfectly honest, I have a hard time listening to stuff that is not produced well. So, I do tend to use that as a sort of a gateway or yeah. Uh, Asian hat asking tin T4 versus the SSR. So that's actually a pretty interesting comparison because I think there are some similarities. I think the tin T4 has got, um, the base character on the tin T4 is going to appeal to more people. And in fact, I think it appeals to me even more. I, I talk about not really liking a lot of bass quantity, and I think that is true of the Tin T4. Although it's got more sub bass, definitely more sub bass than you get on the SSR, it's not as much bass as you're gonna get on something like the Blonde BLO3, or even as much bass as you get on the Moondrop Spaceship. The Tin T4 is kind of an in-between there, and I think it's actually a pretty good balance. Uh, I think that upper mids, I think pretty much every part of the Tin T4 Honestly, like tonally, I prefer to the SSR. There's some other things about the SSR I actually like a little bit better than the Tin T4, like the build quality, the fit. I like that in the SSR better than the Tin T4, but just purely in sound signature, uh, I would pick the Tin T4 for just being more balanced sound, nice sub bass, still fairly neutral tune, um, but just overall more balanced. Uh, Terry Meyer, what would I recommend for under a hundred bucks for someone that primarily listens to hard rock and metal music? So, uh, I mean, my, my recommendations under a hundred bucks are going to be things like the tin T4, if you can get it, the blonde BLO3, if you want more bassy signature. Um, I do quite like the Moondrop SSR, the tin T2. These are all good recommendations, but your question was, you know, which one for hard rock and metal? And this is where I actually have a hard time answering questions like this, because when I'm listening to music, usually, or when I'm listening to an IEM and evaluating it, I'm listening to all kinds of music. And for me, I don't really find that like one particular IEM sounds good with this genre versus this genre. So I don't know, like metal, 
metal and hard rock, honestly, it's gonna depend more on the way that a particular album was produced, right? And I've talked about this before where, you know, there, I find that there's more difference in how an I am um, performs with a, a, given, a given song, right? There's more difference between bands within the same genres than there are between genres, if that makes sense, right? So like how one electronic album sounds versus another is gonna be, there's gonna be as much potential difference there as there is between one electronic album and a rock album, at least in terms of how I perceive the qualities of IMs mapping to the qualities of that music, if that makes sense. Um, kind of the only exception that I give is that there are some IMs that I do prefer or that I think do better with electronic music versus more natural instruments. And that's probably sort of a, a quality of, you know, the timbre of the sound quality. Um, you know, a lot of balanced armature IMs, I think, sound especially good with electronic music, and they might not sound quite as natural with uh, acoustic music or, you know, guitars and drums and stuff like that as a dynamic driver might. Uh, Jairab Desai asking, hey, thanks for letting me know what the name stands for, though what does the S in MRS stand for? Also, what kinds of YouTube channels do you follow and watch frequently? So um, S is just my last name, Sully. So Mark Ryan Sully is my full name. Um, I tend to go by my full name in professional settings. Uh, so MRS, there you go. Um, and then the second question, which kinds of YouTube channels do I follow and watch frequently? So. There are other audio channels that I like to watch. Um, the headphone show I like watching a lot. I like watching, um, I'm blanking on everything right now. Um, there's, yeah, there's a bunch of different audio reviewers that I like to watch. So that's one category. I like, of course, tech videos. I like MKBHD, Unbox Therapy. Um, I don't know. Actually, you know what? If you go to my YouTube channel, um, at least on, on the web. I know it's a little bit different when you browse by an app. If you go to my YouTube channel, I do have a few YouTube channels in my like favorites section that might not be what you expect. So there's some things like Fortnite, which is a motorcycle centric channel. I'm glad I actually looked at this because I just, I'm not gonna think of these things offhand. Fortnite, if you're into motorcycles, that channel is freaking awesome. The reviews, the the, the commentary, the analysis, that is a really good channel for a channel that's basically run by a, a motorcycle gear retailer. Uh, FGC Translated is a very good channel. The FGC stands for fighting game community. So if you're into video games, fighting games like Street Fighter, Marvel vs. Capcom, Dragon Ball Fighter, stuff like that, I like that stuff. And a lot of the fighting game community, a lot of the best players are out of Japan. And so FGC Translated, this is a very, very useful channel that will record clips of Japanese live streams, you know, where, you know, you get someone like Daigo Umahara doing a live stream play of, you know, looking at the differences between Evil Ryu and regular Ryu. And for folks like me, I don't speak Japanese. So those videos tend to, for me are, are unfortunately just like, I, I can't really consume them, but FGC translated, they'll actually go through and translate some of those clip outs, which is super, super useful. Uh, I also got David Zong on here. He's a, uh, he reviews like, you know, desks and Ikea chairs and stuff like that. He just has a really, really good style that I love quite a bit. You know, he will make something like an Ikea desk chair, a very compelling video to watch on YouTube. Eric Weinstein, a little bit of a heady guy if you're interested into, or if you're interested in just like science and thought and like reasoning and stuff like that. Very interesting to watch. Um, yeah, I, I watch a bunch of different stuff on YouTube. I don't watch TV really at all. I mean, sometimes I'll sit down and watch TV with my wife, whatever she's watching, but I don't go out of my way to watch TV. All of my entertainment is basically YouTube or the internet otherwise. Uh, Ikage saying, love the shirt. Again, if you're just tuning in, this shirt is a super review shirt. If you want this shirt, you can actually buy it on Teespring. I should have a link pinned to the top of the chat as well as a link in that pinned comment underneath this video. 
It'll go to the Te Teespring store with this shirt and others. I sell them for as cheap as I can. I think that's like 20 bucks. Um, I'm not trying to make money off these shirts. I just think that's fun to make, frankly. Taryn saying you found my Discord link on my About page. Yes, that is another place. If you're on the website, on the YouTube website, you can go to the About page for my channel and there will be a link to my Discord channel there. Whew, my voice is running out, so I'm probably gonna have to wrap up pretty soon. Uh, Edwin Chan asking about the Shozi CP versus the Tin Hi Fi P1. So the biggest difference between those things, honestly, is going to be actually the driver, the 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 actual drivers, like the character of those drivers kind of comes out, right? They're, they're both relatively neutral tuned IEMs. I think that the biggest difference that's gonna stand out is that the Shozy CP has got a little bit more mid treble, whereas the P1 is actually a little bit dark in the mid treble region, but has more extended treble, so more air to the P1. So for that reason, I think the P1 is gonna be easier to listen for a lot of people. Um, I think that Apart from that, tonally wise, they're fairly similar actually. Um, and so the bigger differences are gonna be balanced armature versus the planar magnetic, which just kind of behaves, I think, uh, fairly similarly to a dynamic driver. So the base presentation, neither of them is a very bassy IM, but the base on the P1, I think has got more body and it feels more visceral. Whereas the base on the Shozy CP is, um, it's BA base. It's not bad, but uh, it's BA base. If you're into base, you probably won't like that a lot. Um, I think that I find, I mean, the BAs are easier to drive, so that's going to be easier to run off of a phone or a low-powered digital audio player. Um, and I think that another big difference is fit. I think the Shozy CP is just one of the best fitting IEMs that I've got. And for that reason, the CP is an IEM that I, I personally use more than my P1s. Sound signature wise, I prefer the P1s, but in terms of what I actually end up using day to day, it's the CPs just because of that fit, the comfort, and I can sleep in it really, really well. Gogite saying, keep up the good work. Thank you for the super chat. Again, you guys don't have to do that, but I totally appreciate it. Thank you guys for watching. I mean, that's gonna be the end of this video. Um, I told you I was gonna do a quick listen to this, so for all intents and purposes, this is the end of the video. I'm gonna spend like two minutes giving these 10 T2 pluses a little bit of a listen and I'll give you an initial impression. But apart from that, thank you guys for watching. If you like this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, ding the bell, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Base, yes.
So now I'm asking about my flax source. Sorry if I'm talking loud, I'm actually listening while I'm talking, so this is bad YouTube, but uh, my flax source is primarily either Bandcamp, in fact I think I got the Marias here on Bandcamp, or Compact Discs. Remember these things? I'll buy used compact discs on eBay for like five bucks. Rip them. All right, for real, this is the end of this live stream. I will say the initial impressions of this video, this I am, I'm not gonna give you impressions of my video. What the hell am I talking about? Initial impressions are, this is, this is a very strong contender. Uh, there is more bass body on here than I expected from a Tin T2 I am. I think people are gonna be pretty happy with that. Uh, I would say that the treble, there is a little bit of a brightness in the treble, which, it could be a little bit too sharp for some people. That's my initial impression, but we gotta burn this thing in, right? We gotta get some of that high-res placebo going on. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and end this live stream. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel. I'll see you guys on the next one.